All right, well, thanks for having me. I know we have to make this a little shorter than we normally would. Part of what I do these days is run a community cultural center that I helped found in Michigan City, Indiana. This evening we have a series of artists, live painters, poets, hip hop artists, um, all kinds of people who are gonna be poets and spoken word artists who are gonna be at our space this evening. So I have to catch the 443 South Shore back and you know, the wonderful infrastructure of the United States. The trains run like every three hours, so <laughs> you have to catch them when you can. So since I had thought we were going to start at 2.30, what I'll do is I, I broke this talk up into three portions. The first portion is why the left doesn't talk about organizing or vision. The second portion is three different approaches to community organizing. And then the third portion is what we're doing in Northwest Indiana. So the kinds of efforts and activism that are taking place there. The first part I'm going to try and cut short. So I'll run through here. I'll read a little bit of what I have written down, but then I'll also just kind of ad hoc uh, summarize it for folks here. Take as much time as you want. There's really no limitation on that. We're just going to truncate the Q&A. So the Q&A portion. Yeah, just okay. do your thing. So I think to most, most folks in the room today and to those watching at home, it's clear that large portions of the left avoid talking about vision, organizing, and strategy. Visit any left-wing website, bookstore, or alternative media source, and you'll quickly discover a deluge of information, analyses, critiques, and reflections describing at great length and in spectacular detail what is wrong with the world. But you will find very little describing or even hinting at what might be done about humanity's numerous social, political, economic, and cultural ills, at least beyond buzzwords and ambiguous concepts such as eco-socialism, just transition, or even Bernie Sanders' political revolution. So what these concepts mean in the real world is completely unclear, though Sanders' political revolution likely provides the best example of how to connect with ordinary Americans. How concepts such as eco-socialism or anarcho-syndicalism relate to existing social movements and political parties is uncertain, though various traditions no doubt influence existing movements for better or worse. The writers and theorists who've created and employed these concepts have very few connections or interactions with organizations and individuals who are actually organizing. This represents an ongoing problem on the left. Namely, organizers don't write, and those who do write are not organizing. It's a real problem, uh, and in my experience, this is widespread, and it's not just in the American left either. So organizers in some ways tend to be anti-intellectual, and I think there's good reason for that. When you're organizing day to day, your efforts are largely focused on how can you turn out people, how can you organize the next event, et cetera, et cetera. But I would also argue that a lot of left-wing academics tend to be obtuse and disconnected from what's happening in the streets and neighborhoods of the United States. Another problem is that writers and theorists who use these terms often fail to provide any meaningful details about how such a future society would be structured, let alone how we would get there. So for instance, what is the role of the state in a society based on eco-socialism? Do we seek to significantly reform the existing state apparatus? If so, how so? Should the state be decentralized? And if so, how is a decentralized state structured in the real world? Are we simply restructuring the U.S. state, or are we seeking to restructure global capitalism and, in the process, global governmental bodies? How will a decentralized state perform essential tasks? So far, that's yet to be seen, again, in the real world, such as maintaining vital infrastructure, communication systems, respond to increasingly deadly natural disasters, and eventually, in the coming decades, tens of millions of climate refugees, likely by the middle of the century. So, again, you know, I'm sorry if this sort of comes across in the wrong way, but I don't think that the local anarchist groups can coordinate relief efforts for the eastern seaboard. I can only assume that the state can be structured in different ways and will be structured in different ways under different circumstances and in different contexts and geographical locations. So how do we collectively create visions and ideas for a new society with our counterparts overseas? These are the major questions the left has to answer. Today, the global left, much like the American left, is fractured and ideologically incoherent. We have no unifying vision for the future, hence no strategy. 
This represents a fundamental problem that we must address if we're serious about rebuilding left-wing institutions and movements on a global scale, and in a manner capable of dealing with 21st century crises, particularly climate change and ecological devastation. These questions are rarely, if ever, directly addressed by left-wing scholars, writers, and or organizers. Consequently, left-wing groups are directionless and continue to hold events, rallies, actions, and single-issue campaigns with little long-term or structural successes. To be fair, the left has plenty of scholars and theorists who write. Kianga Taylor, Slavoj Žižek, Judith Butler, Simon Critchley, Michael Hart, Tony Negri, Cornel West, Noam Chomsky, Elaine Badu, and the list goes on and on. But their analyses are often focused on describing the world in which we live, not a new one. Unfortunately, at least for the time being, it's clear that developing alternative visions of a more just and peaceful society just isn't as sexy as describing the decline of Western civilization or humanity's impending extinction. Perhaps, as some scholars have said, it should be those who are on the ground developing such ideas. If that's the case, we need organizers to start writing, but we need a left that's also willing to listen. Instead of talking about the world we want and how we're going to get there, many people on the left would rather discuss ecological collapse. I see this all the time. I think it's pretty easy at this point to talk about dystopia. We run into people in our small city of 35,000 people in Northwest Indiana who know that we are fucked in not so many words. To me, it's clear why people like talking about the collapse of civilization. It's comforting, and it allows people to avoid responsibility. If we're all doomed, why should anyone even bother organizing? It allows people, especially middle class and rich whites, to avoid reality while pretending to care. If they were being honest, they would simply say that they're hoping to die before things get too bad. This is something I've also heard from people on the left. It's also quite convenient for those in power, as dis disempowered, depressed, and alienated people are easy to control, as are people who don't know what they want or how they're going to get there. All that said, I don't want to minimize our ecological reality. If human beings don't stop governments, corporations, and militaries from destroying the planet, subsequent generations will quite literally experience a living hell. In short, as the world's top cli climate scientists warn, the future of the planet and the species depends on our ability to create alternative institutions to the existing dominant institutions and systems of our time. Our task is immense. No previous political movement or generation has had to cope with the triple tasks of addressing existing injustices, creating a new society, and preparing for impending and inevitable ecological ruptures. Here, it's understandable why many leftists avoid writing or talking about alternatives and a future beyond dystopia. For many people, imagining a just and peaceful future is difficult, if not impossible. That's the power of propaganda and hypersocial alienation. That said, new challenges require new ideas. Clearly, no one has the answers, but many people do have decent suggestions. In fact, one of the few left-wing writers and thinkers who's advanced in detail a different economic system is Michael Albert of Z Communications. There have been others, but I'm most familiar with Albert's work on this topic. His vision is called Para Econ, or Participatory Economics. His latest book, Practical Utopia, is one of the few left-wing books in recent memory that lays out how the left would actually envision a different society. I think his work should be considered, debated, and improved upon. If people in the audience are aware of other contemporary left-wing thinkers who've advanced visions for a new society or a new economic system, I would definitely be more than happy to hear about them. Please tell me about them after the talk. I think if we're serious about organizing, we should remain humble and open to new ideas and methods. Previous social movements and revolutions provide case studies of what to do and what not to do. We should approach them accordingly. In other words, it makes no sense to me to fetishize or overly glorify previous revolutions. We should learn from their successes and their mistakes. And we should recognize that political movements and resistance and rebellion will look different depending on geographical, social, racial, political, religious, and economic contexts. However, that does not mean that we should avoid creating universal political projects and visions for the future. Quite the contrary. 
The prevailing win wisdom, at least it seems to be, among left-wing and progressive activists is that our movements can simply operate on their own little islands and that somehow, by the grace of God, things will work out for the better because of our cumulative efforts, however uncoordinated and non-strategic they may be. Perhaps the most toxic legacy of the collapse of the Soviet Union is the left's inability to articulate a vision beyond traditional ideologies surrounding democratic socialism, socialism, anarchism, or communism. One of the primary challenges we face is the idea that there are no alternatives to global capitalism. In order to properly challenge capitalism, the left must develop an alternative vision. It's easy to tell someone that capitalism is bad. In fact, according to recent polls, many young Americans agree. Their future doesn't look bright under the current systems of commerce and government. Here, I'm thinking of Ursula Le Guin, the great late science fiction novelist who once said that the divine, you know, to paraphrase her, at one time it seemed like the divine right of kings was the end. You know, was there going to be a future beyond the divine right of kings? It seems to be the same today with capitalism. And speaking of Zizek, I think a great point he makes, and I mentioned it to Robert before we got here today, is it's really crazy to me, and it seems to sort of symbolize this power of propaganda that people can envision a dystopian future. We're talking about, like Elon Musk, the billionaire uh, owner of Tesla and so forth. You can get Americans to think about, and even many people on the left, to think about what it would like, what it would be like to colonize Mars, but it's hard to get people to think about an alternative to capitalism. To me, that tells you really everything you need to know about where our culture is at right now, not only as a, a nation, but I think also even on the left. In my opinion, one of the best ways to beat fascism is with a true left-wing vision. It's not good enough to be anti-Trump or anti-alt-right. We have to describe in some detail what we want. That's how we will defeat the right, Trump, the alt-right, and the white nationalists. I would also argue the neoliberals. In some ways, Bernie Sanders did this in I think he did this with his campaign, which represented really the most successful and important progressive electoral effort in my lifetime. Some would argue maybe 50 years, some would argue maybe the century. Uh, this was, in my opinion, a lot more significant than Obama's run in 2008. There were a lot of people who got involved during Obama's run, but they really weren't orientated around any serious form of progressive politics. With Bernie's campaign, I found at least half of the people we're working with today, especially the younger people, these are people who are orientated through that campaign. And something else I had mentioned to Robert, and it's actually in this next paragraph here, I'm writing that the left's task is to build upon Sanders' successes and to point out his flaws. I think we should build upon this vision of democratic socialism. That is where people are at right now. Um, and I think a lot of ordinary people, it was obvious, identified with this message. But I would also say that this, just to be clear, democratic socialism represents maybe a starting point. This is obviously not the end point of what we hope to achieve. As my friend Lear Keith says, quote, we meet people where they're at, but we never leave them there, unquote. I think that's what's most important. Um, the Sanders folks are much more radicalized than any other group of constituents that I've seen in the mainstream since I've been involved over the last 12 years. And these are folks, I think, who've spent a lot of time over the last year learning significant and fundamental lessons about how the Democratic Party works, how power works in the real world, how the media operates, and so forth. I think those are valuable lessons. And I think, as I mentioned, that we should build upon this. So two of the areas that I think Sanders was very weak on, one is obvious is U.S. empire, but the other, I would say, is also racism, systemic racism. This isn't also surprising. This is a senator who comes from Vermont. I think the state's like 96 or 97 percent white, so it's not surprising to me that he would be lacking in that arena. With regard to U.S. empire, I, I mean, it's clear that there's, there's a, a flaw in Sanders' politics there, a fundamental flaw in understanding how the global empire interacts with global capitalism and so forth. But it's also not surprising that that's the candidate that sprung up in 2015, 2016, because the left doesn't have an anti-war movement right now. So without an anti-war movement, it's not surprising that you wouldn't have candidates that would reflect those politics. 
So Sanders' campaign, to me, proved that tens of millions of Americans are actually clamoring for democratic socialism. They believe that the government should provide affordable housing, meaningful employment, free college education, health care and essential services, public education, a green infrastructure project, etc. The real question for the left is, how can we broaden and deepen Sanders' vision? More specifically, how can we build the power we need to win the things we want? Simply holding annual conferences, online forums, and all of the rest obviously isn't good enough, nor are the one-off occupations or rallies. Lifelong leftists, I think, need to ditch some of the cynicism and nihilism that I've encountered. I mean, I think at this point, the best thing that older leftists can do is provide guidance and mentorship. What are the lessons that you've learned over the years? What's worked, what's not worked? Um, in terms of bringing any kind of despair or cynicism into the room, it's just not helpful. I actually don't even have time for it. Like tonight, I'm going to go to an event after this is over with. There's going to be 70 or 80 people there, the vast majority of whom will be under the age of 40. Way less cynical, and for good reason. People who have been on the left, I get it, they've had their teeth kicked in for several decades and the rest. That's understandable. You can understand why people would be cynical at some times. But I would argue that it's not really helpful for the new activists that you're bringing into the mix, the new people that you're bringing into the fold. Uh, they don't want to be met with cynicism. They want to be met with someone with a smile on their face, excited, ready to plug you into new projects and events and campaigns and so forth. So developing a new vision for society, whether at the local, regional, national, or international level, requires a certain level of seriousness, intentionality, and commitment. Once our vision is developed, organizers must develop potential strategies to reach that vision. These strategies should be tested, examined, and changed with time and under varying circumstances. The goal should be constant improvement and barometers to measure our successes and failures. Once our strategy is developed, then people can consider tactics. I see it all too often. People want to talk about tactics, they want to talk about strategy, but they don't have a vision. They want to talk about tactics, but they have no strategy. It doesn't work that way. And you can see why a lot of projects fail. Once your strategy is developed, then people, of course, can consider t tactics. Our tactics, much like our strategies, should be tested, examined, and changed accordingly. This is also something a lot of left-wing groups don't do. That is, try a theory, test it, and actually practice praxis. Let's see if your theory works, put something into action, then go back and reflect on whether or not what you thought was going to work worked, and then change your methods accordingly. I can't even begin to describe the hundreds of events that I've been to over the years that were utterly detached from any kind of broader vision or strategy. Just a one-off event for the hell of throwing it. People hold events and then they subsequently ask, why didn't anyone show up? Or worse yet, they come to the conclusion, no one cares, or Americans are just dumb. In reality, the group or individual in question simply doesn't know how to organize. But instead of recognizing their shortfalls, they blame everybody else. This is also a very, odd, this is a very common thing on the left. I hear it all the time. Organizing, like anything else, is in discipline. This requires a certain skill set and a base of knowledge. It takes years of research and real world experiences to improve. And even then, there are many different approaches to organizing. Some folks come from a union organizing background, but that doesn't tell us much because every union organizes differently and comes from different organizing traditions. Generally, we can say that the public sector is better than the private sector, but even within both sectors, some unions and locals are better than others. The same is true of community organizing. Some people are highly influenced by, say, Saul Alinsky. Others come from a faith-based approach. And still yet, some come from, say, an anti-war approach, pacifists, Mennonites, uh, socialist background, et cetera, et cetera. So in short, what people have to understand is there are a thousand different approaches to organizing, but each of those approaches has a different set of principles and methods in a way that you would go about your organizing efforts. Some work better than others depending on different contexts and goals. Overall, and for any number of reasons, too many to properly address in this talk, the discipline and skill of community organizing has been totally lost. Large NGOs now dominate the progressive landscape. Unions, for the most part, are nowhere to be found. And we don't even have to talk about the Democratic Party. Independent political organizations deeply rooted in their communities, in my thinking, is really the 
only path forward, especially in the short term. I do think it makes sense to work with NGOs. I do think it makes sense to help caucuses reform their unions, to make them more democratic and so forth. But independent political organizations that are deeply rooted in a geographical place seem to me to be the ones who are winning the most victories today. So here in this next section, three dominant approaches to community engagement, I'm working primarily off of Jane McLevy's work. Jane McLevy is a lifelong union organizer. For those who uh, have never heard of her work, I suggest going to YouTube, check it out. She's got a lot of different lectures there, and I'll also be quoting directly from her book. So McLevy argues that the primary reasons, I'm sorry, McLevy argues that the primary reason progressives have experienced a four-decade decline in the United States is because of significant and long-term shift away from deep organizing and towards shallow mobilizing. I agree. Her work better reflects and describes the challenges and approaches I've seen over the past 12 years than anyone I've ever encountered. Her book is the best book on organizing I've ever read. McLevy's hypothesis is actually threefold. For McLevy, the split between labor and social movements has also dampened what minimal organizing has taken place over the same period of time, specifically since the Reagan Revolution. McLevy draws a distinction between advocacy, mobilizing, and organizing, creating a framework that I suggest every activist or organizer who's serious in the country should consider. So let's break down these three different forms or approaches to activism. In this section, I'm gonna quote directly from McLevy's book, no shortcuts, organizing for power in the new Gilded Age. So what is advocacy? Advocacy doesn't involve ordinary people in any real way. Lawyers, pollsters, researchers, and communications firms are engaged to wage the battle. Though effective for forcing car companies to install seatbelts or banishing toys with components that infants might choke on, this strategy severely limits serious, power, serious challenges to elite power. Advocacy fails to use the only concrete advantage ordinary people have over elites, large numbers. In workplace strikes, at the ballot box, or in nonviolent civil disobedience, strategically deployed masses have long been the unique weapon of ordinary people. The 1% have a vast armory of material resources and political special forces, but the 99% have an army. So what is advocacy's theory of power? It's an elite theory. Advocacy groups tend to focus on one-time wins or narrow policy changes, often through courts or backroom negotiations that do not permanently alter the relations of power. What is advocacy's strategy? Their strategy is heavy on litigation, heavy spending on polling, advertising, and other paid media. What is advocacy's approach to people focus? Well, their people focus is virtually none. So here we can think of any number of organizations that would fit under that rubric. Who are we thinking of? Maybe the Sierra Club, maybe Ralph Nader's organization. These are groups who primarily fight their battles in court and they have no significant interest in gaining massive amounts of power or turning out masses of people. So the second approach, and this is the approach that McLevy would argue that the left uses too much, I would argue the same, and we can come up with a number of real world examples of how this has played out over the last decade or so. So mobilizing, what is mobilizing? Mobilizing is a newer mechanism. Mobilizing is a substantial improvement over advocacy because it brings large numbers of people to the fight. However, too often they are the same people. Dedicated activists who show up over and over again at every meeting and every rally for all the good causes, but without the full mass of their co-workers or community behind them. This is because professional staff directs, manipulates, and controls the mobilization. The staffers see themselves, not ordinary people, as the key agents of change. To them, it matters very little who shows up or why, as long as it's a sufficient number of bodies appear to the event. Enough for a good photo op, and enough for a good tweet, maybe to generate some decent corporate media coverage. The committed activists in the photo have no part in developing a power analysis, they aren't informed about that or the resulting strategy, but they dutifully show up to protest after protest that rarely matter to the people who are in power. Mobilizing's theory of power, primarily an elitist view. Paid staff or professional activists set goals with low to medium concession costs, or more typically, they set ambitious goals and declare a win, even when the win 
or so-called win, has no or only weak enforcement provisions. Their dealings are still backroom, secret deal-making made by professionals, paid professional activists, is usually the common path. Mobilizing strategy, campaigns, single-issue campaign after single-issue campaign run by a professional staff or volunteer activists with no base of actual measurable supporters that prioritize frames and messaging over building power. This I hear all the time at different organizing retreats. Let's focus on the narrative. Staff selected authentic messengers. These are the people that a staff will select. You've seen this in kind of the fight for 15 efforts. This would be a great example of mobilization. This isn't actually real organizing. This is mainly mobilizing groups of people. These aren't neighborhood by neighborhoods who are organized. These aren't organizations that have any real base of power. This is the SEIU propping up a group that's barely been able to function on its own in the Fight for 15 campaign. That's why people haven't seen any real victories for the Fight for 15 campaign outside of liberal enclaves like Seattle or uh, San Francisco over the last five years. And the groups existed for about a half a decade now. So if you're wondering why do groups like that not really accomplish much, I would suggest reading McLevy's work. So these self-selected sort of staffs, so like the staff from SEIU will find like a black kid from the west side and they'll say, all right, this kid is the authentic messenger. Now this kid who agrees, or this gentleman or this woman who agrees with their message, they might self-identify as a progressive or a liberal and they generally agree as McLevy saying they show up to the events and after event. That doesn't mean that they're a leader. You know, just because they're showing up to an event doesn't necessarily mean that they're an organic leader. McLevy talks in length in her book about what organic leaders are, and all of you know them. You might be them yourself. You know, who's that person in your congregation? Who's that person in your neighborhood? Who's that person in the workplace that people respect? Meaning, if Bob says X, Y, or Z on the shop floor, 60, 70% of that shop floor is going to go, you know what, I agree with you, Bob. Bob's a good guy. Bob's a stand-up guy. Bob's the kind of guy that people in the neighborhood or the workplace go to if they have a problem. Bob's the kind of guy that people go to if they have something to talk about or they need help. Those are the kinds of organic leaders we should be seeking out. Not just the people who self-identify as leftists show up to every meeting and we go, well, you know what, Bob's been to the last 15 meetings, he might as well be the treasurer. That's not, again, this is not the way to find organic leaders. So these authentic messengers represent the constituency to the media and the policymakers. Again, everyone in the room has seen this a million times. How many press conferences has Fight for 15 held in the city where they march out, five or six people, usually people of color, hey, I come from the south side, my life's tough, I need a higher wage, and then we move on to the next mobilizing effort without much success. But they have no, the other part of this that's very cynical on behalf of groups like, and I don't want to just pick on SEIU, but we'll just say the Fight for 15 campaign, and I noticed this in the anti-war movement as well, but oftentimes these authentic messengers have little or no say in the strategy or running of the campaign. So I've been a part of other organizations and projects and efforts where they're happy as hell that an anti-war veteran is there to, say, be in front of the cameras or give a talk or answer questions from the media, but they don't actually want us to be a part of the decision-making processes. They don't want us developing vision or strategy, and that's part of the problem. And this is why mobilizing in many ways is an elite approach to, to uh, activism. So mobilizing is people focus. Their focus is on grassroots activists, people who already self-identify as leftists or progressives, people who are already committed to the cause, who show up over and over again. When they burn out, mobilizers just find new and also previously committed activists who are then recruited. So we've also seen this. This works best with some of the mainline, or so that some of the more mainstream socialist organizations, they operate largely off of like cultivating a new crop of uh, college students. And that's a great, you know, the young, you plug them into an event, you get them going for three or four years, you burn them the fuck out, and then after four years they're gone. They're move on. And it doesn't really matter because if you live next to UIC or DePaul, you got another crop of thousand freshmen coming in anyway. So if you burn out that latest crop and send them off to whatever state or city they're going to go back to, it doesn't really matter because you got a new crew of college students that you can burn out again for four years and then send them off to their jobs or wherever they're going to go. You never really build a base and you never really build an infrastructure to plug in people in the community who might not be college students or already self-identify as leftists. So the people focus of mobilizing grassroots activists, people are already committed, when they're burnt out, you find new activists, 
then you burn them out and you find new activists, and so on and so on. Social media here is way over relied on. This is something else that's been going on for many, many years now. Social media is good to turn out people if you already have the connection with those people. We see it time and time again with our community cultural center. We can use it to expose people to new ideas, to let people know that there's an event coming up, but it works best with people that we already have a connection with. It's not this tool that's gonna actually help us organize. It's a tool that can help promote events. It's a tool that can maybe expose some of your efforts, but it is not a tool that is gonna be solely used for trying to organize or mobilize people. It just doesn't work that way. And, and as McLevy's saying, it's over relied on, and I agree. So organizing, the third approach, and the one McLevy would, would argue people have moved away from, and here she's bringing up, you know, she talks a lot about the old AFL, she talks a lot about the traditional socialist and communist organization, she talks a lot about the union workers back in the 1880s and 1930s, and not just in vague terms either, like what were the things that these workers were actually doing? So not just holding events where people speak, not just rallies, not just strikes, She's talking about some of the old AFL events where they had boxing nights, for instance, casino nights, nature walks as groups. These are all things that the union used to do on a regular basis. It wasn't just, hey, show up to this rally at 3 o'clock and then go home. It was, come to the union hall, have a drink, have some dinner. Oh, we're going to have a barbecue on Sunday. Yeah, we're going to invite people out to the home. We're going to get together. We're going to go watch boxing matches. We're going to watch movies together. Those kind of social activities that people on the left and people just in America in general largely don't do. I was mentioning the, and I'll get into this, this portion about organizing, but just as an aside, I was mentioning to Robert, one of the best writers about this particular topic is a Canadian sociologist by the name of Morris Berman. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with his work, but he wrote Twilight of the American Century. The better book is called Dark Ages America. But he brings up all of these polls, you know, so it's like, I'm rough, just roughly, like 1975, 86% of Americans say that their fellow neighbor can indeed be trusted. 2005, 86% of Americans say their neighbor can't be trusted. 1975, the average Americans holding 14 to 16 house parties, birthday parties, or social gatherings a year at their house. By 2005, that number's down to four or five times a year. And we can go on and on and on with those stats. So organizing. Organizing places the agency for success with a continually expanding base of ordinary people. A mass of people never previously involved who don't consider themselves activists at all and who don't self-identify as leftists or progressives. That's the point of organizing. In the organizing approach, specific injustice and outrage are the immediate motivation, but the primary goal is to transfer power from the elite to the majority, from the 1% to the 99%. Individual campaigns matter in themselves, but they are primarily a mechanism for bringing new people into the change process and keeping them involved. In other words, single issue campaigns are not the end, they're simply a means. The organizing approach relies on mass negotiations to win, rather than the closed door deal making typical of both advocacy and mobilizing. Ordinary people help make the power analysis, design the strategy, and achieve the outcome. They are essential and they know it throughout the process. Organizing's theory of power, mass, inclusive, and collective. Organizing groups transform the power structure to favor constituents and diminish the role of their opposition. Specific campaigns fit into a larger power building strategy. They prioritize power analysis, involve ordinary people in it, and decipher the often hidden relationship between economic, social, and political power. Settlement typically comes from mass negotiations with large numbers involved. So what's organizing strategy? Organizing strategy is recruitment and involved of specific large numbers of people whose power is derived from their ability to withdraw labor or other cooperation from those who rely on them. Majority strikes, sustained and strategic nonviolent direct action, and electoral majorities. Frames matter and narratives, of course, matter, but the numbers involved are su sufficiently compelling to create a significant earned media strategy. Mobilizing is seen as a tactic, not a strategy. What is organizing's people focus? 
organic leaders, the types of, of which I mentioned before. The base is expanded through developing the skills of organic leaders who are key influencers of their constituency and who can then, independent of a paid staff, recruit new people never before involved with activism. Individual face-to-face -face interactions are most important. And this, of course, seems to be what's most lacking on the left today. So now that we've had a rough understanding of the difference between the three forms or methods to activism or the approaches, and I should be very clear to note that this is like less than 1% of the information that's contained in McLevy's book. And again, I suggest that people here should read her book. Let's turn to some of the work that we've been doing in Northwest Indiana, specifically Michigan City, but I also want to mention what's happening regionally because I'm assuming people here don't get regular news reports about the political activism that's taking place in Northwest Indiana. I assume you probably don't even get regular reports about what's happening in Pilsen uh, or Little Village or the East Side, where I'm originally from. So, red state organizing. Okay, let me give you a quick background. I live in Michigan City, Indiana, a small city located about 60 miles east of where we stand right now. Like many Rust Belt cities and towns, Michigan City has its share of challenges. Any of them, and many of them, of course, are quite serious. Our city is roughly 60% white, 30% black, and 10% Latino, Hispanic, or Asian. The child poverty rate in our city is 44%. The overall poverty rate in real terms, using real numbers, is likely around 50 to 60%. Our disability rate is 22% in the city, and for those who live in poverty, the disability rate is 36%. Young people are leaving our city at an astounding rate, and this is a point I'll return to later because this is part of the strategy of the 1% in the Rust Belt and in the Midwest area who've been playing these states off of one another. Everybody here is familiar with that. Come to Indiana. Low taxes, no environmental regulations, treat your workers like shit, do whatever you want. You know, and this is the case in Wisconsin, Iowa, Missouri, Michigan, and Ohio as well. So my other larger point would be to the people in this room, if we don't build progressive political power across state lines, it doesn't matter what you do in Chicago, and it doesn't matter what you do to change Springfield. If Springfield and Chicago, who aren't necessarily the most progressive areas, but more progressive, say, than Indianapolis or St. Louis, those cities and those areas will continue to drag places like this down. I think Browner's just the beginning of something like that. The two tallest buildings in Michigan City are a coal-fired Nipsco power plant and the Blue Chip Casino, owned by Boyd Gaming Corporation. Michigan City is also home to the Indiana State Prison, the only place where prisoners are executed in the Hoosier State. Despite all of this, our city also functions as a tourist attraction during the summer months. Rich folks, hipsters, and yuppies from the Chicago North Shores come and visit on the weekends. Their primary destination is the beach and the lighthouse outlet stores. So $2 million, lake, $2 million lakeside mansions are located less than a mile away from $30,000 dilapidated houses on the east side of Michigan City. So you could drive a mile from the east side where people don't like to go, largely black neighborhood, but also poor whites, and you can drive a mile to the beach and you can buy homes on the east side for twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000, no problem. And they're homes that you can live in. And then if you drive a mile down the road, you can buy a home for $2 million. So this is the kind of contradictions and insanity that, I, I mean, I can't, I can't see how much longer that lasts as things continue to get worse after the next recession, which is on its way. When that happens, I can't imagine that kind of a social structure lasting for much longer. I can't imagine people who are barely getting by living less than a mile away from people who are making a half million to two million dollars a year. So our city officials and business leaders cater to the rich Chicagoans, not surprising, leaving thousands of residents behind in terms of housing, education, public safety, health care, and living wage jobs, let alone a clean environment. For those of you who haven't been to Northwest Indiana, or aren't aware of the sort of uh, ecological disaster that it is. It's also an ecological wonder, but the, the, the disastrous legacy of industrialization is really talked about at length and in great detail by a friend of mine who also has spoken at OUL in the past, Thomas Frank. So that's not the Thomas Frank of Listen Liberal, but that's a different Thomas Frank who lived in East Chicago. Check out his stuff. 
So developers, the casino, the power plant, big box stores, and local, the sort of local petty bourgeoisie, and the prison call all the shots in our city. As a result, ordinary residents work low-wage, service sector jobs, endure drug addiction, racial segregation, so social alienation, political disenfranchisement, and all the rest. The upcoming South Shore Double Track project, so I took the South Shore train here, it runs from South Bend to Millennium Station, stops twice in my city. This is supposed to cut the train ride down from Michigan City to downtown Chicago from an hour and 45 minutes, which is what it takes me to get here now, to 58 minutes. The strategy is to lure white Chicagoans out of the city and to a place with a more affordable cost of living. So you can work in Chicago, come live in Indiana. We got low taxes, cost of living is way lower, do whatever the hell you want to the environment, treat your workers like shit, or even if you're just a worker without a business there, come live out here for this low cost of living. We're gonna gentrify Michigan City so middle class whites who, and working class whites who don't wanna live in the city, who can't afford living in the city, can afford to live in Michigan City and commute back and forth. This is the strategy between the states. This is how it works in the real world where I live. This is sort of how gentrification works where we're at, as opposed to what's happening, say, here in the city, which is a little different. So in the Midwest, it's a constant race to the bottom. As I mentioned, states such as Indiana, Wisconsin, and Ohio battle over who can provide the least amount of environmental protections, works, worker safety laws, union rights, taxes, public services, and so forth. It's clear to me that if progressive organizations don't start to operate in a regional capacity and with a regional vision, we are doomed to continue these unfortunate and destructive trends. Overall, Northwest Indiana is a deindustrialized region that's very segregated and still quite industrialized despite all of the deindustrialization. Some of the world's most powerful corporations actually operate in our backyard. British Petroleum, for instance, US Steel and Acceler Middle, to name a few. In fact, British Petroleum, BP, is operating one of the largest oil refineries in the Western Hemisphere, no less than 20 miles from where we're sitting today. And do you know what they're refining, refining in BP? They're refining tar sands, imported from Alberta, British Columbia, Canada. Tar sands, for those who don't know, is one of the most toxic and most labor-intensive sources of fuel in the world. It has destroyed large sections of the boreal forest, and the mining towns in Alberta, Canada endure catastrophic rates of sexual assault, violence, and suicide. So destroying the environment in Canada, extracting a dirty resource, and then pumping it down to a, a largely a community of color in East Chicago. So I'll give a quick overview of what's happening in terms of progressive politics in the region, but also what they're facing in their cities, and then I'll describe a little bit of what we're doing in Michigan City and also with our community space. So East Chicago, Indiana is not only coping with the BP oil refinery, but also, and just recently, those of you who watched Thomas's lecture will know, over 1,500 residents who were, were forced to evacuate the West Calumet housing complex because of the soil and water being extremely contaminated with lead and various other toxins. So as a result, Thomas Frank, Reverend Cheryl Rivera, and others created the Community Strategy Group. Uh, they've been providing immediate relief for families and community members impacted, and at the same time, they've been challenging state and local officials to provide the needed resources and manpower to clean up decades of toxic industrialization. Without their work, the Democrats and the local officials in the city wouldn't have done a damn thing. I mean, I don't think that's surprising to anyone here in the room, but again, it's, it's sort of a testament too to this power of organizing under such terrible circumstances. You know, able to get a community, largely a community of color, destroyed by years and years of toxic air, toxic soil, toxic water, and actually organizing in that community poses challenges that are just far beyond what they are in diff when you're organizing in other communities. So they're doing their best to build power in a, in a city totally devastated socially, culturally, economically, and politically by the very industrial corporations that helped build this country. East Chicago, much like many cities throughout the Rust Belt, is what Chris Hedges refers to as a sacrifice zone. The city is 50% Hispanic Latino, and the other 50% split between white and black residents. Cities like East Chicago face significant challenges, but also pose amazing possibilities and opportunities. If cities such as East Chicago can organize racially, ethnically, and gender diverse progressive political movements, I would argue that any community in the country can do so. Amazing things are also happening in Gary, Indiana, a city that gets a bad rap 
people call it the murder, they used to call it the murder capital of the country, et cetera, et cetera. I would argue that's because the national media has focused on all the wrong stories in Gary, Indiana. And let's be serious and let's be clear, Gary faces tremendous challenges, no doubt about it. Everyone knows that. But people such as Sam Love and Corey Hellberg of the Calumet Artist Residency and the Gary Poetry Project give me hope. So here's a city that if, at first glance, people driving through would say, man, this place is just falling apart. What's going on? Is there any love here? Is there any community? There's tons of community and there's tons of creative action taking place there as well. You know, other groups that are involved in Gary are also the Black Lives Matter group, NWI Gary, the Indiana University Northwest Social Justice Group, the IUN Black Student Union, and numerous artists, poets, activists, organizers, and educators who work and live in Gary. If I had more time today or at a, in a future uh, uh, date or at a future time for this, I would love to go into detail about how, what these groups have been doing over the years, but I'm gonna give you a quick overview. So right now, one of the biggest com campaigns that's taking place in Gary, Indiana is the Northwest Indiana Resistance Coalition's efforts to stop the deportation of immigrants from the Gary Chicago International Airport. Every Friday, immigrants are bused in, largely from Chicago, but also other parts of the Chicagoland region, and flown to their next destination be before being forced to leave the United States. In the past 10 years, over 10,000 people have been shipped out of the United States via the Gary Chicago International Airport. Currently, unions, local groups, and national organizations are leading the effort in Gary. Local educator Ruth Needleman started the campaign, where it will go for right now, no one is sure, as with any campaign. But what is sure, and what continues, even yesterday when they had a large rally outside of the airport, I think 150 people showed up, people will continue to organize around this issue. Whether or not the issue poses the possibility of creating a broad-based movement in the region remains to be seen. But I do think it's very powerful for black and white activists in a city that's primarily black to be standing up for immigrants in a city like Gary. You know, those easy arguments can be made in a place like Gary, like, oh, why the hell are you working on this? And we've heard reactionary city council members try and make these arguments in Gary. Well, what about the black people in the city? You know, they've been left behind. They don't really care about the black people in the city. They're just saying, you know, this is, these are the kinds of things that are used in areas like this. And those are the kind of reactionary politics that we're dealing with, not just in white communities, but this is also, as I mentioned, in a city like Gary where a lot of the black politicians are extremely conservative. So in Porter County, which borders Lake and LaPorte counties, it's a different story. Porter County is roughly 94% white. So let me just be clear here. In Northwest Indiana, in Porter County, which is 96% white, it'll take you about 15 minutes to drive to Gary, which is about 85% black. The night and day difference, the median home uh, value in Valparaiso, Porter County, is $170,000. In Gary, I think it's roughly $35,000, $40,000. So in Porter County, there's a total lack of progressive infrastructure. There are, however, some interesting things happening in Valparaiso, Indiana, where students are organizing with faith-based faith groups and local political organizations to potentially open a community space that would function as an organizing hub, much like the one I helped co-found in Michigan City and this is something I'll return to. Unfortunately, most of the activism that's taking place in Porter County is focused on working within the Democratic Party, which in some cases, at least in Indiana, makes strategic sense in a place like Porter County. The problem also in Porter County is there's just nothing else. I mean, nothing else exists. There's no unions, there's no radical organizations, there's no progressive political organizations. The reason it would maybe make sense to strategically organize within the Dems in a place like Porter County is because the Democratic Party in a place like Porter County is just an empty vessel. If the people in this room lived in Porter County and wanted to like take over the county party apparatus, you could do that. The state party's so weak, they don't even have the power to come and stop you. So if you wanted to like create the Porter County Socialist Party of America and put it under the Democratic Party's name, you could do that in Porter County. It's just a matter of organizing power. Um, there's no one, like I said, it's not like Chicago. There is no Democratic machine to stop you in Indiana. The Democratic Party doesn't do anything in Indiana. Um, though in Lake County, to be honest, there is remnants of that Chicago machine because it's closer to the city. So 
The problem with places like Porter County is that it's also culturally isolated and remains locked into this sort of suburban, rural 1950s ideology. So white kids there are still popping out two, three babies, they got two car garages, they got SUVs and all the rest. They are quite literally living like it's 40 or 50 years ago. There's no change in terms of the way that they're living, which is quite astonishing, really. Um, that said, I do think it makes great sense to organize in places like Porter County. Otherwise, I think the left risks the possibility of white enclaves devolving into something much worse than Trump's milieu of disorganized alt-right internet trolls, white supremacists, and outright fascists. In other words, if places like Porter County don't get organized, in the context of ecological devastation and financial collapse, the poli I think we'll be looking fondly on the days of Trump's politics. In South Bend, which is located 40 miles to the east of Michigan City, activists are organizing with electoral candidates to defeat the right-wing incumbent. For us, this would be a big deal, as millions and millions of dollars are poured into state and federal races in places like Indiana by the Koch brothers, right-wing lobbyists, and local and state-based corporations. Hundreds of thousands of dollars, in fact, to races that are uncontested. Um, the, it's quite amazing, actually. The latest and biggest victory in our region has been the defeat of Core Civic, a private prison corporation who wanted to build a multi-million dollar immigrant detention facility in Elkhart County. Local activists led the charge, but business leaders and government officials quickly followed suit, especially when they saw the tides changing. They were, they were able to organize a broad-based coalition and defeat the project before the permits were even signed. The organizers in Elkhart and Goshen were building off the successes of previ previous anti-prison efforts in the Northwest Indiana region. Private prison corporations have tried to build in Crete, Illinois, Hobart, Indiana, and Gary, Indiana on two separate occasions. The latest in 2016 when Geo Group, formerly Corrections Corporation of America, CCA, tried to build an immigrant detention facility across the street from the Gary Chicago International Airport. Of course, now that you know what's going on in the airport, it would make great sense to house the immigrants next to the airports, then they can easily be shipped off the next day. That project, of course, was stopped. In Michigan City, where I live and organize, local residents created the Michigan City Social Justice Group, an independent political organization immediately following Trump's inauguration. The group started out modestly holding educational events and talks on current events. The biggest challenge, at least in the beginning stages, was to orientate the group in a way that didn't allow us to focus solely on Trump or the GOP. And let me tell you, I mean, that, that was a difficult, difficult process immediately following the election, especially for people who were just setting up organizations, maybe didn't want to work with existing organizations like Indivisible or Our Revolution. We're getting an influx of people who wanted us to oppose each of Trump's transgressions and appointments. So we get people coming in. Are we going to react to Jeff Sessions being appointed? What are we going to do about this? What are we going to do about this? We had to tell a lot of those folks that that's not what our organization was about. Some of those people have come back after months and months of realizing that that approach didn't work. But I think there's a lot of people, progressives and liberals and otherwise, who are learning that that's not a sustainable way of approaching this. So many people fell into the same trap that I witnessed during the Bush two years, namely focusing all of their energy on electoral politics and neglecting the very difficult process of building independent social movements and organizations that outlast political parties, candidates, or the latest trends. The Bush years gave us Obama, the Trump years will likely give us someone even worse, at least judging by the current crop of potential 2020 Democratic Party candidates. Cory Booker, Joe Biden, let's not go down the list. I can't even begin to list the number of organizations that have formed in the Trump era, even in Northwest Indiana, and I'm talking dozens of organizations. It's actually an absurd amount. Many of them dedicate their time to writing congressmen and senators. Some of these liberal groups are better than others, but all of them lack an understanding of social movement organizing. I would argue that one of our primary tasks is to bring these people into the mix of more radical politics and action. Most people, even those who are committed to different progressive political causes, do not understand the difference between electoral organizing and social movement organizing. I would also argue, though, that a lot of people on the left have maybe neglected having a decent electoral strategy while also doing social movement organizing. So what I notice 
my anecdotal observation is that most of my left-wing friends want to focus all of their energy on social movement building and very little energy on electoral politics. My more progressive liberal friends focus all of their energy on electoral politics and very little on social movement organizing. And I would argue a big part of that is because they don't actually understand what social movements are. So, excuse me, one of the tasks I think of course is to bring these people into the mix, but we think that's possible through popular education, working together on projects and campaigns when we agree, and opening most importantly our community space to both liberals and radicals alike. That's something we've done very good with the park space. One of the social justice group's first successes was the Bismarck Hill campaign, where we stopped the city and a private developer from building a $1.5 million adventure park on LaPorte County's tallest and last remaining untouched sand dune. This, for us, was an opportunity to directly challenge a neoliberal project and immediately put a win on the board. In other words, we wanted to show people this is what it looks like to win. While it's true that we won the campaign, it never left the mobilizing stage. We were able to mobilize enough people to halt the project, but the campaign was unable to help the social justice group build a base of power in the city, and for good reasons. Namely, the campaign was centered in a community that's predominantly upper middle class or rich and white. That said, I do think that such small victories are important. We canvassed neighborhoods, talked to residents, and pointed out the city's hypocrisy and short-sightedness in public forums. And those things became quite apparent for people who showed up to the public meetings. Our next campaign was part of a regional effort to pass welcoming city ordinances throughout Northwest Indiana. Because sanctuary cities are illegal in a state like Indiana, a team of lawyers and activists developed an ordinance that would provide the maximum amount of protection under Indiana state law. Several cities passed these ordinances, but Michigan City actually did not. Going through the process, however, did shed much light on the inner workings of our city government no less or more corrupt than the major cities around the country. Who's connected to who, who supports who, where do they stand? And in that way, I would say even failed campaigns are sometimes very useful. At the same time, however, we learned that addressing an issue someone in the organization found important isn't necessarily the way to build or gain power, especially in a city that's less than 7% Latino or Hispanic. Left-wing organizations must address the issues their respective communities find most important. If that's housing in your community, start with housing. It makes no sense to go to your neighbors and talk about a war with North Korea if they don't give a shit about the war with North Korea. If you're interested in talking about that issue, that's one thing. If you're interested in actually organizing your community, you have to start with the issues that people in those communities care about. And again, to Lear Keith's quote, that doesn't mean that you leave them there. And that doesn't mean that you don't tie those issues together, but it definitely doesn't mean to go into a community that's experiencing massive unemployment or needs affordable housing and then tell them that their issue is sort of secondary to whatever issue it is that you care the most about. If it's healthcare, I would say start with healthcare. And I think this is an important lesson for our group to learn at such an early stage. In the midst of these campaigns, the Michigan City Social Justice Group has also been working with HealthLink a nonprofit group that provides health care to local residents. We've been testing the children of Michigan City for lead because much like East Chicago and other parts of the Rust Belt, our city is experiencing a lead crisis. Less so than East Chicago, but still quite catastrophic. So this is taking a page out of the Black Panther playbook, not the movie, the political party. We think it's important, though I saw the movie last night, it was actually decent. We think it's important for left-wing political organizations to provide real-world material support to communities. I think the Black Panthers pre breakfast program brought more people into their organization and built more trust among the community than any other single project the party did. In my personal opinion, progressive left-wing organizations should be able to do several things. One, I think they should be able to provide immediate support to their respective community food, clean water, after-school projects, educational opportunities, healthcare services, and so forth. We should be able to build independent political power outside of the electoral arena, and we should have a strategic and effective approach to electoral politics. All too often, groups get caught up doing one or the other, but rarely all three at once. So after a year of existence, the social justice group is now going through an intensive restructuring process. 
What does it mean to be a member of the Michigan City Social Justice Group? Do we want our members to pay monthly dues? After all, every organization needs funds. I do not know of any progressive, effective, pol progressive political organization in the world that doesn't operate with funds. What is our membership intake process? What sort of guidelines, rules must one follow to maintain membership, and what's expected of our members? How does our group make decisions? A 70% majority, a simple 51% majority, consensus, and when and under what circumstances? In other words, choosing to support a rally or a protest might have a different decision-making mechanism than fundamentally altering the mission of the organization. Choosing, and as I just said, so how are these decisions made? What happens in the case of internal conflict? Many groups deal with internal conflict, but few groups have a process for actually dealing with it. Organizations need conflict resolution teams. It's hard to work with dozens of people, let alone hundreds. Having a clear decision-making process and group norms is also a must. If people don't trust how the organization is making decisions, they will quickly walk away. Transparency here is essential. The Chicago Teachers Union is currently dealing with a ton of internal problems because people in their leadership have deviated from the agreed upon decision making mechanisms that the Chicago Teachers Union agreed upon many years ago. So there's a lot of infighting and a new caucus has been formed within that union because of those practices, which is a real shame because they've been one of the few shining lights in organized labor throughout the country. So right now we're working on the group's values. This is an important process. Our values should dictate our vision, which should dictate our mission and strategy, then our goals and tactics. What's our vision for Michigan City and how do we plan on achieving it? How can we create mechanisms so new members can alter that vision? We don't want to become rigid or sectarian. How can we maintain enough flexibility to incorporate new activists and their ideas? After all, we don't want to become rigid and we never want to turn away new members because they disagree with our program, vision, or goals. Now, if they fundamentally disagree, that's one thing. But if we have minor disagreements and folks are coming into your organization and they're saying, hey, I think I might have a better way of doing this. You cannot have the old guard that's been there for 10 or 20 years saying, well, I don't agree with that. Well, that doesn't sound good to me. That's the best way to make sure that your organization is going to die. So. How can we create mechanisms and processes that will allow us to revisit our vision and strategy on a regular basis? This is also something that a lot of groups don't do. So they'll create their vision or strategy, then it's set in stone, and they very rarely revisit it. So these are the sort of questions I think we should be addressing. If this seems a little bit tedious, that's because it is. Organizing work can be very tedious. It can be fun. But it can also be quite challenging, emotionally and intellectually. So how will the Michigan City Social Justice Group approach the 2018 midterms? What about the 2019 local elections? Many members would like to see our organization run a slate of progressive candidates, but on what platform? And under what banner? Are we going to run as Democrats? Are we running as Greens? Are we running as Independents? Are we running as Socialists? And if elected, what sort of programs could a minority group of recently elected city council members implement? Here we can see the need for social movements even with electoral victories. In other words, electing progressives isn't good enough as I think most people in the room understand. Hell, even holding them accountable isn't good enough. We need political candidates who come from social movements and who are accountable to social movements and communities, not corporations or in our case, developers. So we have a city council of nine people in Michigan City, six wards and three at-large seats. Let's say we can get three city council members elected in 2019. What does that mean for 2023? How can we use the energy of the 2020 election to plug more people into long-lasting efforts and deeply rooted community efforts like the ones we're doing at our space? One of our tasks is to stop the cycle of two to four year involvement around election cycles. We have to create and build a culture of resistance. To me, that means making political organizing and resistance, cultural projects, and involvement a normal part of our everyday lives. As McLevy notes, we can't just surround ourselves with self-identified radicals or even progressives. We have to be willing to work with liberal groups and organizations that are currently doing the work. Where I live, we don't have the luxury of being picky in terms of who we work with and who we don't, especially in a place like Northwest Indiana. <laughs> 
The left is just too damn small where I live. I guess the same argument could be made at the national level, but that's a conversation for another day. So over the long term, I'd like to see independent left-wing organizations on every ward of our city, with people organizing block by block, not only to stop right-wing developers and politicians, or to hold progressive politicians accountable, but to build alternatives to our existing institutions while creating cultural and provide creating culture and provide needed services to residents. We'd like to see educational programs, healthcare clinics, after school centers, and cooperatively owned businesses that have long-term viability. I'd like to see the casino, power plant, and prison shut down and closed. And I'd like to see our residents used to take care of Michigan City residents, our resources used to take care of our residents, not tourists from Chicago. So I think those things are possible over the next five to 10 years. Over the same period of time, I also think it's possible to lay the foundation for what could become one of the most progressive areas in the Great Lakes region. If organizers from East Chicago to Elkhart continue to build their bases, we can mount a serious challenge to both political parties and the hegemonic corporations that operate throughout our region. In short, we could start to build the sort of progressive majority that's needed to transform our state and region. If other cities and regions throughout the state of Indiana do the same, we'll be in a very good position 10 years from now. At that point, I think it will be possible to work across lines in a truly progressive way, creating progressive majorities across the Rust Belt. That's my vision. One of the things that's most needed across the US are radical political and cultural centers. That's something we've routinely noticed over the course of our organizing lives. Communities lack spaces, even somewhere like Lincoln Park. I see the amount of groups who are using the Lincoln Park Public Library. It would seem to make more sense to me for Lincoln Park to have a radical community cultural organizing space. I love libraries, but it's not exciting to come to a library. Um, and you can't hang out here, you can't have drinks here, you can't have cultural events here, people can't just stop in on a day-to-day -day basis. There's enough money in a neighborhood like this where this group of moms who just met here to talk about guns, they should have a, their own space to do this. They, there's enough wealth up here to do something like that. In some communities, churches function in this capacity, especially in rural areas. This is something the left has been missing as well. If you want to connect with people in rural areas, you've got to be willing to talk to the local faith-based community. Those churches are the cultural centers in rural America. In suburban areas, your only option is a local sports pub, and in small cities, your only op option is usually some kind of local dive bar. So our space, and this is should wrap up the talk here. Our space that we helped open is called Politics, Art, Roots, and Culture, or PARC for short, P-A-R-C. It's a 1,600 square foot building and open to the public seven days a week, nine to five Monday through Friday, 10 to five Saturday and Sunday. PARC is a non-consumerist space, meaning you don't have to buy a damn thing to walk through the door. We have an extensive library, internet access, and plenty of coffee. Local groups such as the Michigan City Social Justice Group, the Socialist Party of Northern Indiana, Concerned Citizens for Syrian Refugees, Parents and Friends of Gays and Lesbians LaPorte County, and many other local organizations use our space. But we also have national organizations who use our space. Moms Clean Air Force, Unite Here, Veterans for Peace, the Sierra Clubs Beyond Coal Campaign operates out of the park space for its meeting. So we currently have a full-time organizer in, in Michigan City who's targeting the retirement of the Nipsco coal-fired power plant. We hold educational events, lectures, film screenings, live music performances, cultural events, and even life-saving trainings, such as the Narcan trainings we recently held with the LaPorte County Health Department. Narcan is a nasal spray that's used for opioid overdoses. It can help save someone's life for up to an hour before the ambulance gets there. Stuff like that on the surface, again, might not seem very radical, but it is a way to build community. And we believe that we're really at this infant stage of building community across large part portions of the United States. So tonight, a local activist and community gardener named Dominique Edwards is holding an event with the Decolonize Your Mind Collective for Black History Month that will feature hip hop acts, live painting, DJs, spoken word, and radical poetry. Next week, we're holding a documentary film screening with Black Lives Matter, and the week after that, we're holding a commemoration for the 15th year 
anniversary of the war in Iraq. The possibilities for this space are truly endless, but one thing is for sure, community spaces are essential to organizing efforts. The park name is actually a play on words. Of course, parks are public spaces. Park, at its core, is a public space. But for me, the politics plus art plus roots equal culture. You cannot have culture without roots. You cannot have culture without art. And you cannot have culture without good politics. So we believe communities need all of the above to not only survive the next century, but to thrive during the next century. They need a political analysis of what's happening in the world and what we want as an alternative. And we need to be able to articulate these thoughts and ideas to the general public. And they need to be rooted in geographical spaces and time. Too many people bouncing from city to city. Some of this I know from the precarious work that's created by our global capitalist economy. Nonetheless, the more rooted communities are, the more rooted your efforts are, the more effective they will be. And if all of these things are done intentionally and with great effort, I think we can create a culture of resistance that's hopefully capable of tackling the 21st century's unprecedented challenges. Thank you for your time. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Great talk here, Vince. Um, the only thing I want to kind of apologize for is we, we just don't have the capacity to do um, a Q&A now because he's got to go and uh, we got to get him to the train station so he can get back down there. But, you know, tremendous ideas that you put forward here today. And uh, one of the things I think we're going to do is have you back and uh, we'll have the opportunity to have a more extended time so people can actually get some ideas out. Because you put a lot of things out there on, on the table for, uh, I mean, food for thought, so to speak. Uh, but it was an excellent presentation, so I want to thank you for that. So with that, that's going to be it, okay? Thank, thank you, you again. Thank you. Could you spell McLevy? Yes.